the FESUD project, which is on financialization, economy, society and sustainable development, is concerned with many issues on the role and nature of the financial system, the causes and consequences of the financial crisis, and ways to better design the financial sector to serve economic, social and environmental purposes. And in this work, we are very pleased to be supported by the Scientific Advisory Committee and Stakeholder Group. And I have with me one of the members of that group, Professor Stephanie Griffiths-Jones. And I'm going to be talking to her on some of the issues which she raised in her keynote address last evening on the role of the financial sector in the economic development. Stephanie, I'd like to start by asking you, often there's been debates over many years on the relationship between the financial sector and the real sector of the economy and how far financial development aids economic development. Would you think that we have now gone through a phase where financial development has aided economic development and we're now into a situation where more rapid growth of the financial sector may even be harming the economic sector? And perhaps another way of putting it, has the financial sector now become, in some sense, too large? I think that's a very central question. Um, there has been in the past a very big literature that tried to show econometrically through cross-country studies that the bigger the financial sector, the better. And uh, in, in some way that was an absurd argument because it would have meant that if 100% of GDP was absorbed by the financial sector, that would be the best for growth. Um, and this, this literature is important because it was very influential uh, in justifying financial liberalization and growth of the financial sector. Um, strangely, um, there were some voices, like that paper by uh, Easterly, Islam and Stiglitz, uh, or almost 15 years ago, that started raising concerns that at a particularly high level, the financial sector could, as you say, become too large and harm the rest of the economy. And that line has begun to be uh, accepted, particularly after this last big crisis, the large North Atlantic crisis, by institutions like the IMF and the BIS and by some mainstream academics. And I think this is very important because it says that we have to think about what scale of the financial sector we need to support the real economy. Now, in addition to the size of the financial sector, one might also say what are the best forms of structure for the financial sector to best in the sense of aiding economic development, aiding poverty reduction and so forth. I wonder if you could first indicate your thoughts that you were talking about last night on the role of development banks in, in that sort of process and how they may be a suitable way for the financial sector to operate. I think that uh, it, it has now come a time, maybe, to, to rethink, as you say, the structure of the financial sector. There was an assumption in, in, in Western capitalist societies that the more private sector you had, including in finance, the better, again. And now that we know that the private financial system is so riddled with market imperfections, or indeed markets are very incomplete, um, and, and we don't seem to be able to fix it. It's very good to try and, and fix financial regulation, but we're not very successful. Um, there may be a very strong case for having uh, public development banks, good public development banks, and for a number of reasons. I think one, which is again op a discussion which has opened up, is governments may want to encourage in developing countries, but also in countries like Europe, restructuring of their economy, for example, towards a more green economy. And for that, they need instruments. And a public development bank is a very valuable instrument in that sense. In developing countries, they may want to lend more to SMEs. And again, public or smaller uh, decentralized cooperative banks may be a better instrument than the big private banks. Uh, secondly, um, uh, private finance tends to be very pro-cyclical. So in bad times, they stop lending to you. Often that causes the crisis. 
And one of the big advantages of public banks, because they're owned by government, is that they can be what economists call counter-cyclical. They can actually increase lending in bad times. And this has happened. Even the World Bank, the regional development banks, national development banks like German KFW uh, have increased lending in bad times, which has made the crisis a little bit less bad and finance some valuable investment. So I think that the case is, is increasingly strong for, for development banks. And one thing that is, I think, attractive for governments, particularly in Europe, where uh, fiscal constraints are so tight, perhaps wrongly so, but, but they are very tight, is that through development banks you can get a lot of leverage. With a relatively small uh, increase of paid in capital, you can actually increase lending for financing investment on a much larger scale. So doing sort of more with less, I think, is very attractive. And this is the case for having doubled, for example, the capital of the European Investment Bank. Do you think there's the, with the political forces behind using the, the European Investment Bank in this much rather more developmental way? Um, so I wonder if you could th- indicate what, is it where the political forces might come from which would enable that to, to happen. Well, it was very encouraging that last year, um, starting with the leadership of Francois Hollande, and uh, then this was accepted at the European level, one of the few measures that were taken to encourage growth in Europe uh, in this kind of sea of austerity and fiscal consolidation and and wage control was that they agreed to double precisely the the paid-in capital of the European Investment Bank, and that could generate uh, about 60 billion euros of lending a year, um, which could lead up to, um, if you double that, about 120 billion um, of, or more perhaps, 160 billion uh, of of investment a year. And that would generate quite a significant impact on jobs, on, um, on growth, on the demand side. But also, of course, it's very important on the supply side because, as, as, as we were talking before, you need to restructure the European economy, increase the productivity, increase its competitiveness, and you need, you need uh, efficient investment to do that. As, as the private banks are not doing it, uh, this is a very useful vehicle to increase both supply and demand and therefore facilitate growth. Um, the question is whether you, sh- you can do it quickly enough because... As we know, there's 26 million people unemployed in the European Union, 10 million additional after the beginning of the crisis. So there is an urgency to do much more. Perhaps even this increase of capital is not enough and they should do much, much more. Um, Because I think uh, the private banks have been very reluctant to increase lending, uh, even though the governments beg them to do so. And so it's much easier to use an instrument where you can lift the phone and say just invest more in, in, in good projects. So I think this is a, a good instrument that has worked in the largest economy in Europe, which is Germany. It's worked in Brazil. It's worked in China. And so because it's well-tested, it's sufficient, I think it's only ideology that holds us back from using it. One alternative approach, which many would advocate, would be can we changing regulations. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this getting the financial sector to better serve the economy can be achieved through appropriate regulations? Is that a a way to go, or or is that, in the end, a dead end? Well, I think that, uh, as you put it very well, getting the financial sector to be a good servant rather than a bad master is, is, is a desirable aim. And I think that in the periods when the financial sector was smaller, and simpler and more transparent and better regulated, like after the Second World War, uh, both in Europe and in the developing countries, it actually seemed to serve the real economy quite well. Um, The problem now is that it has become so large, so complex, so opaque, so profitable, that it has become uh, very large macroeconomically, which has a lot of problems, like we talked about before, but also very powerful politically. And therefore, it is, I think, increasingly difficult to regulate. I think we have to try, and and measures like the Dodd Frank Bill were were a good uh, were, were a good attempt in the United States. But it's 
continually being eroded in its implementation by, by powerful financial lobbies. Um, the financial transaction tax that you and I have written in favor of. Um, again, there's a proposal in the European Parliament, but 11 governments have agreed it, and yet it's always being slowed down by, by the power of lobbying. So any kind of regulation or taxation on the, on the private financial system is always, has been extremely difficult. I think it's actually easier for maybe smaller, uh, for countries that are poorer with less developed financial sectors to actually regulate the financial sector well because the, the vested interests are so no. Not so big. I think it's worth a try, and I think those that are attempting it. But I think we have to uh, remain very, very skeptical about the ability to do that. And, and that's, in a way, why I think you need to diversify the financial system to, to something that works. And one point that I think is really important is that if you think in terms of, from a European perspective, even from a kind of private company perspective, if you want to be successful, if you want to be successful in competing against China, against India, against Brazil, you need a functional financial sector. And we don't have it now. We have a financial sector that's continually creating problems and, and being very expensive to bail out. And, and, and they're competing with countries like China, which have relatively a better financial system. So I think if, if Europeans are thinking as Europeans, they should actually sort out both the regulation of the of the private financial system and expand uh, the, the public development banks. Are you optimistic that we could collectively achieve this sort of changes, which seem to me most profound and in, involving enormous political and social changes? That uh, is there any chance that we can? Um, well, I think technically it's, it's actually quite simple. Uh, particularly, the development of public banks is quite simple. Um, as I said, the, the largest economy in Europe, the, the second largest bank they have is KFW, which is a public bank. It's very effective. Uh, we, we know how to do it. Um, I think financial regulation is more difficult because the gene is a little bit out of the box, and so it's difficult to put it back in. Again, we have a lot of good ideas, including in your very interesting research program. But, but of course, the, the point is the politics. What was interesting that in the 30s, uh, I think the outrage against the banks was so large that they did manage to re-regulate the financial system. Whereas now it seems to be a little bit more complex. But my, my hope is that we still have to keep fighting for it, and, and that's why good research, good dialogue with policymakers is, is, is the only thing we can do. Is this, uh, as Gramsci said, uh, you know, um, optimism of the heart, pessimism of the mind. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, and I hope we can at least contribute to, from the FESOL project to those sort of changes that, that lie ahead and to make our contributions to that policy debate and change the world in the way we hope to do so. Thank Great. you very much for the interview and thank you for your keynote address last night. Thank, thank you. you very much.